Hi, I'm host Eric Rose, talking with famous people. I want to go right off the bat here and say, in this current events video, we're going to be talking about the presidential election. I'm going to be explaining why Trump's actually a better candidate to choose, if you had to choose one of these, than either the Democrat or the Republican candidate, whomever it might be, and why that's the case. However, I want to stress right off the bat, Trump is not a good candidate. There's no reason anybody should vote for Trump. There is an actual candidate that one might consider as a possible candidate, but that's not Trump. I'm just saying Trump's slightly less bad than your other mainstream alternatives, namely Clinton and Sanders and or Rubio, Ted Cruz. All those people are definitively worse choices than Trump, who I'd rather see win than any of those people I named. Why could that possibly be the case, Eric? Trump's an idiot. Trump says a bunch of racist bullshit. Trump had no ideas. His idea is a means idea, not an ends idea. And his apparent goal is be be more badass or something. <laughs> it's like ridiculous. However, he's right to be means focused, actually. The problem that the other candidates are doing is they're ends focused. And they're saying, well, we want to have everybody get free college. We want to have a lot. Well, that therein lies disaster, right? Road to good intention. Well, sure, it would be nice if I didn't have to pay for gasoline anymore. I want free gasoline. There's no such thing as free gasoline. Somebody's going to pay for it. And if I do get free gasoline, and it's the government paying for it all the time, uh, if I do get free college, for example, let's say the government pays for college. So is the government going to hire all the professors now, too? And are they going to be government employees? Are they going to get government pensions and all that stuff? But I can tell you from experience, it is very, very difficult to fire somebody who's a government employee. It is very, very difficult to justify the amount of money they get paid as well. I know this because I was a government employee. Yes, that's right. I worked for LA County Office of Education for about eight years and made solid money working from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. or so and had great benefits. And I, in fact, additionally had a retirement plan in place for me where they put money into CalPERS, which I'm going to take out pretty soon, uh, just to have more liquidity. Anyway, it was great. However, I would point out that nobody owns anything when you're dealing with government stuff. So it's always going to be the worst way to solve just about any problem, except for problems that defy solutions related to ownership. And there are only a few of those. Environmental problems. The government needs to deal with environmental regulations because, and even this is consistent with ownership, but because pollution doesn't stay on your own property, number one, it floats around or goes in the water or whatever. Number two, um, shared resources need to be sustained as shared resources by the body that is in charge of those shared resources, namely the government. So on that level, they basically do have ownership. And then um, number three, it is necessary for utilitarian reasons and for practical reasons that we have environmental laws because too little, uh, too little action can cause too much damage. That's number one, and number two. I mean, that's not a good principle. These aren't good principles. But I'm just saying, from a utilitarian perspective, is why we have to have environmental laws, even though I'm not arguing the utilitarian perspective. Number one is we know from experience that polluted living is not fun. When I was a kid, LA had horrible smog, and it wasn't fun, and we had to stay in a lot during recess and stuff because there was this stage smog road, that stage smog road. Way, way, way better now, and I attribute it to the catalytic converter, getting rid of leaded gasoline, all that kind of shit that people have done in terms of environmental regulations. This is a bit of a slippery slope, but how many we have to acknowledge as libertarians that the government has legitimacy when it comes to environmental regulations because they necessarily must, given the model. 
All right, so once we acknowledge that, then we go return to the issue of, well, what should the government be doing? The government should not be paying for college. Why not? Well, for the same reason, it shouldn't be giving, like, incentives to the market for housing, which it does. When it does that, those incentives get factored into the prices. So, oh, well, now the government's giving you $2,000 back rebate if you buy a house that's got quality X, quality Y. Then that house just becomes $2,000 more expensive. So they pay the same amount, but um, now really the government's paying $2,000 of it. For why? It may or may not. It, I mean, look. Obviously, if you give an incentive to do something um, that's expensive to do, and you make it less expensive, then you do increase the likelihood that people are going to do it. However, with the government, you always will have a, a fair amount of gaming involved. Because the government is trying to set up as a protocol, a codified protocol, some policy that's intended to achieve some sort of an outcome. But in establishing that policy and it, executing it and enforcing it, they have to rely on either systems such as uh, conditionality webs that give you limited amount of input options, or they have to rely on human beings to check and make discretionary decisions. When individual humans are making discretionary decisions when they're working for the government, they aren't saying, Oh, how can I? I'm gonna make a discretionary decision about how to better sell this person on this product. To do that is to facilitate the end of the business, and if you fail, all you do is you lose that sale, right? They are instead, they are not doing that. They are not having to sell anybody anything. They instead force people to do stuff. So for them. It doesn't matter how effective they are, the employees. It doesn't matter at all. And what does matter is their ability to, for them, get a paycheck. And that correlates very weakly with job performance in government, extremely weakly. Because, of course, pay rates don't correlate with job performance at all. They correlate with seniority, they correlate with certain degrees and other symbols of competence that are not the same thing as actual competence. Remember, your degree and your suit and tie and your fancy shoes and your fancy car and your good diction and your um, large vocabulary and your nice haircut and all those things are not competence. They are symbols of competence. And the more symbols of competence you have, the more that means you're in an industry where real competence doesn't matter. If you need a bunch of degrees and stuff to get maximum pay rate at your business or wherever you are at, then your job doesn't matter at all. It, it, it doesn't, or, or at least it may matter, but anyone can do it because competence is an irrelevant factor in its own success criteria. Not necessarily in our success criteria, but in its own success criteria. So we know According to its own success criterion, the government is not interested in competence as a criterion for measuring success. How do we know this? Well, they don't pay according to competence. They don't pay people more who are more successful and less who are less successful. They're always talking about incentivizing stuff and disincentivizing stuff. Why don't they incentivize competence in their own execution by, by tying performance to pay rate. Why don't they? Because they don't care about it. That's not something they care about. It doesn't matter. If I'm unsatisfied with my government, they don't get fewer taxes from me. They get the same taxes from me. So they have no ownership of the link between client and job doer that normally would exist when you, some of your money is being used to do something that's supposed to benefit you. Remember, that means you've hired that person and they're doing something now with your money to, that you've asked them to do. 
Well, we never asked government to do any of this stuff. I certainly didn't. Uh, I didn't ask government for public schools. I don't want public schools. And I don't think there should be public schools. I think they're bad. So I don't want it. No, thank you. I return your public schools, and you can give me my child and my money back. It doesn't work like that. Why not? Well, because nobody owns the outcome. Nobody owns the resource. Nobody owns the outcome. All of the rewards for actual good job performance and competence are social. There are no rewards financially that would suggest the government prioritizes job performance. Because if it did, it would reward it. It doesn't. There are no indications whatsoever that the government is all interested in saving money because if it was interested in saving money, it wouldn't have contracts that make it impossible to fire its employees. It would take advantage of opportunities to be more lean in its operations when they arose and eliminate staff accordingly because it wouldn't want to be so parasitic upon the American people. But we've already proved now, in no certain terms, government doesn't care how well it does its job and that it doesn't care how wasteful it is in expenditures in doing its job. So why would we think it's the best agent to perform something we need done? It's clearly not. Now, let's also look lastly at the role of legislation as a solvency mechanism. The United States government has legislation as its primary tool of action. And the president has no access to that except insofar as he convinces Congress to break the legislation he wants. So when you talk about a President Trump doing stuff, on that one vector, the vector in which government power is supposed to be applied, you'll see that President Trump is not a Trump a president that's going to have much impact on anything. The best kind of impact he's gonna have is to veto stuff, and that's gonna be all positive. Because remember Government is not a good choice for any sort of solution, right? We've established it. We've proved it indisputably. Okay, so we, we know Trump's not going to do damage there. Where will Trump do damage? Well, you might think he's going to use executive orders to sort of make it so is his solution. Well, I don't think he will, frankly. I think he's not going to use them any more than did Bush or Obama. I think when we're talking about Trump in general, we need to remember Trump is objectively, indisputably, a less dangerous choice than was George W. Bush. And I don't mean that just in retrospect. I mean, before the election, before 2011, before anything happened, before war on terror, before any of that fucking bullshit. Um, I would have said, oh my God, George W. was a terrible choice. This guy is going to fuck shit up bad. And in fact, they did say that. And I was accurate. He was, as I predicted, a um, bullheaded moron. It's one thing to be a moron, that's fine. It's one thing to be bullheaded, that's fine. Combine the two, you've got a recipe for disaster. Because they're able to believe it, their own bullshit at 100% velocity. <laughs> and it's all bullshit because they're morons. Trump's not a moron like that. Trump's not a, a belief moron. Trump's, from what I can tell, a very clumsy kind of... Mm, Kind of sort of disruptory kind of a thing probably like an estp it's got a p for sure if we were to use the what that normally taking to mean um he is not into finalizing things he's into flexibility and uh he's into figuring out when we get there a better approach to any presidency than having a vision going in because having a vision going in, um, it's awfully presumptuous, right? Like, the whole rest of the universe is going to continue to stay the same, so my vision will continue to stay relevant. 
No, it won't. And context is first and foremost the defining factor in what you need to do in terms of running the country. Now, if I were actually president of the United States, if I were actually president of the United States, I would not go in there and do a bunch of crazy libertarian stuff and get rid of everything in the world. Not at all. I take very seriously my job and I would take very seriously any such measures I were to put into place. But if people were to ask me in advance in the election cycle, uh, presidential hopeful host Eric, what do you plan to do about X? And a lot of different things I would say, well, we'll have to see how the dynamics regarding this vector, this vector, this vector play out. Over the next this many months, I expect this situation to evolve. So if somebody asks me about Syria right now, or Russia, or any sort of foreign policy stuff, that's my answer. And if they're talking about sort of pattern of behavior that requires a consistent protocol as a response, well then in that case, I'm going to say we're going to identify what the problem is, whether it's our business or not, identify if there are solvency approaches that do not involve any negative rights violations that are likely to actually work then figure out the costs of those solvency approaches, the actual costs, including unintended consequences that could be predicted, but not described, and, um, and including the financial costs up front, and to always err on the side of assuming it's gonna cost more. Now, if your net utilitarian out calculus at the end of that is a negative number, you should never do that. If the net deontological calculus is, we can do this with utilitarian gains, but with rights violations, you should never do that. If the end calculus is, we can do this constitutionally, it's legal constitutionally under the current interpretation, but that current interpretation stretches the meanings of the words beyond that which uh, any normal person would say is fair or just or supports a consistent set of axioms derived from principles that use the same words in different ways, right? doesn't work like that. You can't have equivocation fallacies left and right. And then functionally, the Supreme Court, when they're ruling that everything in the world is the Commerce Clause, are guilty of an equivocation fallacy. They are saying, yeah, if I grow marijuana in my backyard and use it for only my own purposes and never sell it across state lines, that it counts as interstate commerce because it somehow impacts the uh, price of marijuana elsewhere. And thus, because it has some effect upon interstate commerce, that it is interstate commerce. Well, that's clearly insane. So, no valid, no legitimization of any sort of policy action can be made based on that interpretation if you're, if you're arguing a constitutional legitimization. And I think we have to, as libertarians, acknowledge that we must rely on the tool of the Constitution as the mechanism by which we demand that government adhere to its own rules. Libertarians in general don't like constitutionalism because it's not necessarily rights focused, it's not pure, it's not a pure negative rights sort of thing. It's a um, habits of democracy kind of a, a manifestation, uh, a hybrid solution, an attempt to constrain with static language the unconstrainable uh, beast that is a wealth absorbing and consuming and life absorbing and consuming force. Uh, and that is government. And it, it absorbs and consumes lives in a couple of different ways. First of all, it creates work that doesn't need to be done and then hires people to do it. So I was in one of these jobs, right? It's work that did not need to be done. I mean, the kids need to be, the, I had a population of special ed students who were 18 to 21. We get extended public school time because they're special ed. My job was to, my real job was to lift them up on the table, feed them and put them back in, the, in their chair and uh, change their diaper periodically and basically move them, move them basically like a nurse, a nurse for a uh, population of non-ambulatory, severely retarded individuals. And, but a nurse with no nursing duties, just basic caregiving. The sort of thing that you could easily pay somebody $10 an hour for and think it's a fair pay, amount to pay because most of the time they're just sitting around doing nothing. But <laughs> thanks to the government's Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, they're required to hire a credential teacher to teach these people who have neither language nor the ability to move around independently, nor the ability to form a single abstract thought. 
a modified form of the curriculum taught to their same age peers, namely high school seniors. So technically, I was supposed to be sitting in that room reading Charles Dickens to them or whatever and giving them a modified test on Charles Dickens, even though not a single one of them could speak a word and 90% of them shit their pants and were not cognitively there at all. Like you could... No matter, you could do tests with them and say, like, if you can understand me, blink your eyes. I did those on all of them, believe me. So I can see if there's, like, one of them that's awake behind the apparent lack of awareness. None of them were. Uh, they were all profoundly retarded. And probably if you did brain scans, you'd see, like, they had some sort of severe brain damage or whatever. I don't know. So why does the government pay, like, a 25-year-old, 26-year-old college, just out of college guy, $42,000 a year plus full benefits plus pension money um, and as a professional credential teacher to do a non-teaching job that requires just a basic caregiver. Why is the government doing that? Well, because nobody has ownership. Nobody owns that money. So nobody feels like it's being wasted. Because it's not my money the government's wasting, it's somebody else's money or it's taxpayer dollars. The mysterious taxpayer dollars that come from nowhere and go do terrible things all the time. So we know for a fact that government hires lots of people to do jobs that have no purpose. Now, we can be offended the government's wasting of our money and that's a good thing to do. Be offended about that, for sure. But additionally... And I think equally important is be offended on behalf of the people who are hired to do these jobs. Who, who has a life that is best served by um, digging a hole and filling it back in for your whole life and knowing that you are doing something purposeless and pointless and something that exists only as a means of fulfilling some hoop jumping requirement and that you're getting overpaid dramatically for it, but that you're lucky because of this somehow, that you get to go slave with this stupid fucking pointless work for your whole life so you make enough money to do a couple of things you like to do. That's what the government is doing to its citizens. It's saying, come on guys, join us over here on the parasite side. That way, it doesn't matter if you're good at your job. It doesn't matter if you're bad at your job. It doesn't matter if you even go to your job. Because if you say you're hurt a little bit, why then we, you get infinite time off with no ever losing your job. Why, you got the most powerful union in California. You know, you get these, it's ridiculous. Of course, of course nobody has ownership of work that is pointless, that nobody wants done, that nobody would ever pay anybody to do. If they actually owned the money they were spending, and that the product of which nobody wants. Nobody would ever say, I'm going to start a business called the DMV. It sells pieces of paper for your car for lots of money. Nobody would ever start that business because nobody would ever want to pay that because the things being sold are not of any value or use. And when you get punished for not having your registration or your driver's license, you think to yourself, well, gosh, it's odd. You guys are asking me to pay you like hundreds of dollars a year for a sticker for the back of my car. Now you're mad because I don't have the sticker on the back of my car. But I got a question. If it's so important that I have that sticker on the back of my car, then how come nobody's complained about it yet? I mean, if I, it's so dangerous for me to not have that sticker on my car. If I were to see somebody weaving in and out of lanes on the freeway, almost hitting other cars, I'd call the cops. That's dangerous. So if my not having a sticker is such a big deal that you deserve to use threats of violence to challenge me about my lack of sticker, then why hasn't anybody complained about it yet? Because... Nobody thinks it's actually important. If you ask people, should we get rid of driver's licenses and car registration? 
they'll say, no, that's crazy. You can't possibly do that. Why, it would be chaos on the roads. And yet, if you witness that crime of somebody whose registration sticker expired, you don't call the cops. You don't worry. Probably don't even notice it. You don't look for it. You don't go, let's see how safe this road is. How many unregistered drivers are there? If you forget your driver's license at home, you don't suddenly drive worse. If your car is not registered, it does not function less well. If you get pulled over for not having your registration or driver's license, there is not indicated by that fact any increased risk that you put anybody at, even, let alone hurting anybody. Now, speeding, you can say, well, you put people at increased risk. Um, Running stoplight, running stop sign, and put people at an increased risk. At least you can sort of justify it. Car registration. I could drive around in my unregistered car for six months straight, and people would have would have the exact same impact on other people as driving in my unregistered car for zero months straight and getting registered right away. Exact same impact. So there's no utilitarian justification for it. And if people want to say, well, we need it in place anyway, and the only way we can have it in place, we enforce it sometimes. Then, if we really need it in place, why aren't you getting upset when people violate the law? And the answer is because we don't really need it in place. Because it's a complete fucking racket, and we're all getting bent over and fucked in the ass by the government. So, what I am suggesting to everybody who should happen to watch this video is let's stop being so okay with the sodomy. I didn't ask for the sodomy. I don't want the sodomy. It's being compelled onto me by the government. And I prefer they stop sodomizing me if possible. I would like that message to be spread loud and loud and wide and as much as I can. I'm going to try to spread it, which is we are accepting these insane lies as basic foundational societal norms. It's a bad idea. We shouldn't do that. I encourage you to think about what I'm saying. Look into it. You may or may not end up agreeing with me, but um, take me seriously. I'm I'm not just some sort of crackpot anarchy guy. I'm making some really valid points here. And I hope you hear my words and move slightly more to the libertarian side at least. That would make me happy. Thank you for watching Talking with Vince people. Two thumbs up from me.